All right, guys, in the video last week on Saturday, I asked you to submit your questions. I also said it in an email to the Inner Circle mailing list to send me your questions because this week I was going to be doing a Q&A video. Well, you may be able to hear from my voice. I've been ill this week. I've been losing my voice for the last few days. But since I committed to doing the Q&A video, I'm going to do it anyway. So we're gonna get through as many questions as we can before I lose my voice. If you want to be in the next Q&A video, if you want to have your question answered, then leave a comment down below and I'll try and get through as many of them, probably either next week or the week after. We'll try and make this a regular thing. So let's go and sit down and let's get through some of those questions. Come on, guys. All right, guys, I'm here with my laptop, with the old school Duomo logo. We've got loads of those stickers, by the way. Maybe we'll do a giveaway at some point because now obviously we've changed our logo. We don't need a load of old logos. Anyway, I've got a list of questions here, so let's just get stuck into them. I'll stop wasting time. First question, Nick asked, and not this Nick, a different Nick. How did you manage your losses when you first started out compared to how you manage them now? Have you ever lost sleep or panicked over a huge loss to your account? So I think that the sort of process I went through is the same as what everyone goes through when they're becoming a consistently profitable trader or at least thinking about trading in the right way which is that when I first started trading I took losses personally I thought that a loss was a reflection of my own ability that I'd made a decision to open a trade and a loss was telling me that I'd made the wrong decision or I'd misinterpreted the, the analysis. Now the thing is, when you start to learn more about trading, and especially when you've opened more trades, you stop putting so much emphasis on individual trades and start looking at it as a collective type of thing. Because the way you've got to see it is that, you know, the difference between a good decision and a bad decision isn't a profitable trade or a losing trade. It's literally the process that you go through. You can make a good decision and still lose a trade. You can make a bad decision and still make a profit. Doesn't make it a good decision. Like with everything in trading, it's about probabilities. And let's say you make a good decision, you've got a great setup, and you know that there's a 70% chance of succeeding. Then if that trade loses, a lot of people would think, well, why did that lose? There was a 70% chance of succeeding. Well, it could be that either you were wrong with the percentage probability of it succeeding, or it could be that that loss was just in that 30% probability. You know, three out of 10 times is going to lose if you've got a 70% success probability for it, if you've got that 70% chance of succeeding. So I think that the more trades you see over time, the more losses you experience, you stop taking losses personally. And of course, it's frustrating because everyone likes to see their account balance increasing, but it just stops bothering you so much. It's just part of trading. But yes, I have lost sleep over huge losses. I've definitely gone through extremely stressful periods, got very ill from the stress sometimes. Uh, you know, having a losing position that I hadn't closed yet, that I had this loss aversion, I wasn't willing to close it. I've gone through all of that and most people will, but the best way to overcome it is to realize that it's the sort of net effect of all of your trades. It's whether you're net profitable after a hundred trades, not after one trade, okay? So I think that kind of covers that one. Next, Marcus asks, well actually Marcus had two questions, which is a bit cheeky, but the first question was, would you consider doing the live trading videos again? Yeah, I would consider doing it. I mean, what I'm probably going to be doing for the near future is to do videos where after the trades closed, I talk you through the trading, like I did on Saturday, where I talked you through four different trades. Um, the live, live trading videos, I have no problem doing it. It was a bit annoying having your screen recorded for hours, but what ended up happening is that people didn't really watch them. And since this is like a four hour video, I kind of left it as four hours or whatever it was. There were a few of them. I did it three weeks in a row. I picked the same exact time, same exact day each week so that people didn't think I was cherry picking. And I just pressed record and put the whole thing online. Because as soon as you start cutting these videos down, people start saying you're cutting out things you don't want people to see. Whereas I prefer things to be raw and transparent. And so people were finding them boring. Sometimes you'd have a trading session when nothing happened. Some people loved that, some people hated it. But you know, maybe I'll do them. It depends if people want them. Maybe leave comments below if you want to see those videos, if you don't find them too boring. The next question from Marcus, the second question is, how can I prevent jumping into trades without really thinking them through, as this is something that I struggle with? I think that this comes down to the problem of thinking that trading means that you always have to be in a trade. As soon as you realize that trading is as much about the trades that you don't open as much as the ones that you do open, then that's when you stop doing things like that. It's sort of, 
it's going through this FOMO, the fear of missing out. I think you need to realize that the people who are succeeding in trading are not always in trades. And the people that are always opening trades and getting over eager and thinking that just because they've sat there for a trading session, they need to have opened a trade to feel productive. Those people are not going to succeed. You have to go through this phase and it tends to happen with younger people that they feel over eager. They want to always be doing something. They want to be super active. But you need to realize that the more patient you are, the more willing you are to wait for specific setups, the ones that are more dependable, the ones that fit your system, the better you're gonna be in the long run. So when you're about to open a trade, you need to really question yourself and say, is this as good as it gets right now? And if this trade isn't you know, fulfilling all of my criteria, even if it makes me a profit, is it really worth going for? Because if it's the inconsistent one, or it's not as dependable as my other ones, is it just going to distort my data for the long term? If you prioritize your data and having consistency, if that's your priority rather than your P&L, then you'll be in a good place. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you go to assess your data to see what's working or what's not, if you haven't got a consistent approach, if you haven't got a consistent system, then you can't really get much detail out of that data. It's just data for the sake of it because it's just noise. There's a lot of noise in there. But if you're doing something consistently, even if it's not profitable, then you can see what's working and what's not because it's a consistent thing every time. You can make tweaks and changes. So by opening trades when you shouldn't because you know, you're feeling too eager, you're not really thinking them through, then all you're doing is holding yourself back for the long term because you can't get to that point where you're being a professional and optimizing. So next question, Henry asks, how do you trade a small $200 account and grow it into something substantial? I think the best way is to work in a different job or something like that and build up a, a larger amount of capital to trade with. You see, the thing is with trading in general, it's all about risk management. And when you have a small account like $200, you're very limited. First of all, you're relying on leverage, which obviously everyone relies on leverage to an extent, but you're really relying on it. Second, you can't have the conservative position sizes that you really need to have like one to 2% at risk, even if you wanted to go a bit, up, a bit more above that, if you've got a $200 account, the chances are that you're going to be leveraging more. And if you're not leveraging more, if you're sticking to sort of small position sizes, it's probably not going to grow into something substantial. Now, I don't know what your definition of substantial is, but let's say, you know, you could trade it and make $50, that's great, that's substantial, that's a substantial amount. But if you're thinking of thousands or tens of thousands, it's not gonna happen unless you're risking too much. The other thing with a small account is that you can't do things like scaling in and scaling out so easily because you're probably already at that minimum or already at your sort of maximum margin amount and stuff like that. So it becomes very restrictive. So I think the easiest thing to do is to learn with a small account or a demo account. And during that period of learning, which is gonna take a long time, probably longer than you think, then during that time you could be saving money, working extra jobs, whatever you need to build up that capital. It's the unfortunate thing about trading that a lot of people just can't come to terms with, which is that in any industry there are barriers to entry and the barrier to entry in trading is having cash. If you don't have cash, you can't trade. And people say, oh, but like you, you're just being sort of snobby and you, you think that everyone should have a big amount of money. It's just facts, it's just the way it is. Like if you don't have the, the, the sort of bare minimum requirements for an industry, then you can't enter. Is it Porter's Five Force or something that talks about barriers to entry? Can't really remember, but it's any industry. You wouldn't expect to start up a shop if you can't afford the rent to pay for a premises, if you can't afford the stock. Like, what are you gonna say? Oh, but there must be a way I could do it with a small amount of money. That's a really bad example. Next question, Stephen asks, I would like you to classify how many positions should I open in one swing trade? I guess you're probably talking about how many contracts you should open rather than how many positions, because for me, one swing trade is one position. So in terms of how many contracts you should open, it depends on your account size and it would like depend on the setup as well. We use dynamic position sizes and dynamic stop losses. So the first thing you've got to figure out is your stop loss and that's gonna depend on the setup. At what point is the price moving against you so much that you have no control over the situation? Your stop loss should be at that point because beyond that, technically there's no setup for you anymore. So you calculate how many pips that is from your entry. Let's say it's a stop loss of 15 pips or 20 pips. You then use that to calculate your position size because you might see that the setup is not so strong so you want to risk less, let's say 1%. So then you find out what 1% would be divided over that many pips 
figure out the amount of contracts that you can open for that and you open that many contracts. So it's going to be completely different for each trade and it's never going to be the same thing. But as I said for the previous questions, you need to be thinking about risk management. Don't do th things that are too risky. So that means that you should not be risking double digit percentage. You, it should be single digit and it should be ideally below 5%. I always say one to 2%. Some people disagree, a lot of people agree. I'd say one to 2% at risk and that should dictate how many contracts you're able to open. Joe asks, once you've found double confirmation on a higher time frame, do you need to find double confirmation on the working time frames for your entry? Not necessarily. So let's say you've got a double confirmation on the hourly chart, but you're wanting to enter on a 15 minute chart. Well, first of all, you can open it based on the hourly chart alone, but if you want to have a, a smaller amount at risk for the amount of potential return you can get, then you'd be looking at the 15 minute chart. So, or you know, five minute, whatever. If you get a single confirmation, since you've already got a double confirmation, I'd probably count that as being enough. The situations where people go for single confirmation when you don't already have a double confirmation on a higher time frame are the ones I don't particularly agree with only in certain situations. But if you've got that double confirmation already, technically it's in setup. So you just need to find something to convince you that that's the right timing for it on the lower time frames. Julio asks, what would be a realistic annual ROI? return on investment. I understand it's not all about pips, rather minimizing risk and maximizing ROI. In your experience, what has been a realistic annual ROI? So I don't really think of it in terms of annual ROI because during that year, it's a long year. And if you're trading, you might be making withdrawals and so on. And obviously, if you're making a withdrawal from the account, if you're moving it into a different account, it can get a bit complicated basically. So instead, I look at it as like a monthly ROI. And I don't have targets, you know, sometimes you can have bad months, sometimes you're going to have good months, but I'd say consistently I can be above 5% a month as a minimum. That should be something I'm able to hit. Sometimes it'll be a lot more. Last month it was something like 9.5% and sometimes it could be a hell of a lot more when you pick up a big position, you're able to scale in, or when you're stuck in a range or something like that and you've got lots and lots of trades. These days I'm not as active. I choose to trade over longer time periods because I favor more balance. I used to be a lot more active trading around the clock. I realize that's not good for my health, or my social life, or many other things. Maybe like maximum couple of trades a week. Sometimes it can go a bit more if we're in a range, like I said. But yeah, I'd say from like 5% to 12% is quite normal these days, but it can go much higher. Doesn't tend to go much lower than that. So, you know, you can extrapolate that, compound it, whatever you want to figure out what your potential annual ROI would be. But keep in mind, I've been trading for over 10 years now, so it takes a while to get to that level of consistency. Next, Francesco asks, what kind of advice would you give to someone like me who isn't able to find a fixed time slot to allocate to trading because his working hours are never the same and don't follow any rule? It's tough because I think with trading, you're going to get the best out of yourself if you've got routine. So I think just try to divide the day up into portions. You know, you've got a morning session, you've got an afternoon or evening session, you've got a night session, and find like certain approaches and ways of working within each of those. Like base a plan around one of those sessions as if that was the session that you're going to use all the time. Then when you're working hours, when you find out what they are during that week or that month, whatever sort of schedule you're on, then you can just find which slots in, like which, which sort of sessions are going to be best for you. Now, while you're learning, I always recommend trying to experience as many things as you can in a short space of time. So using the lower time frames. So at the moment, if you're learning, then use like the lower time frames during that session. If it's a night session, things might not be as active and so on, but just suck it up and deal with it because it's good for your learning. Or use previous charts and do like, you know, treat them like they're live charts, but just go back to maybe like, I don't know, 2011 or something and start from there and just go bar by bar and make your decisions like that. But when it comes to your live trading, then you've obviously got to find what's most profitable for you still fitting around your working hours. So for that, I'd switch to like nothing lower than hourly, ideally maybe even daily. And that way you get in a situation where you don't have to be checking the trade every five minutes or something because the bigger movements are normalized you know, candles end after a longer amount of time, especially daily, you can check it once a day. So it doesn't really matter if you're then working morning shift, night shift, whatever it is, 
because you only need to check once a day. So as long as you're able to do that, you'll be fine. And it is it's frustrating because I know you want to be active, but you've just got to fit it around what's realistic. And for a lot of people, trading's a lifestyle type of thing. It's more like a hobby, a part-time thing rather than full-time. So your priority is what is your day-to-day -day job or what you do every day, your family, whatever you need to fit into your day and then fit trading around that. And it can be done. I've done it in the past, so just stick with it. Next, Sims asks, do you have any South African students or am I going to be the first? And is time difference between here and where you are going to be a big challenge for me? We've got South African students already, quite a lot of them. Trading seems to be really popular in South Africa. So, and it's getting more and more popular, which is interesting. So you're not the first, you're not the only one. Sorry if you wanted to be the first one. And the time difference is not going to be a bit of a problem. I'm sure that there are some South Africans watching that can maybe leave a comment letting you know what times they trade. But I think it's not too dissimilar to what I'm doing anyway. So it's really not a problem. And if you're talking about our course, then you don't need to be on the same time zone as me anyway. You could be trading whatever time you want and we'll find a way to be able to still give you feedback and stuff. That's what we do on the forum. So no, it's not a problem. I know you're not the only South African. And final question, Aaron asks, what is your opinion on people under 18 starting to gain interest in trading? So I think it's a good thing to start off young learning. I don't necessarily think it's a good thing to below the age of 18, get your parents to open an account for you and start actual trading with real money because I think you need the time to learn. And I think that probably your idea of a long amount of time of learning is not going to be what actually needs to be done. I also think the younger you are, the more you are susceptible to the sort of tendencies and biases that lead to bad trading. And as you grow up, you lose those a little bit more. You're also more inclined to rush things and stuff like that and like want profit quickly. You're less conservative, less patient. Obviously that is now tiring everyone with the same brush. There'll be some people that aren't like that. But I think that it's not a bad thing to be learning at that young age. It's a great thing. And there's other things that you can learn while learning about trading that as part of trading that are going to improve the rest of your life and potential careers you may have. But I just wouldn't rush into doing live trading. Give it a couple of years. You've got all the time in the world and you know, you'll know you eventually be able to trade consistently profitably as long as you you know take the time understand that things aren't going to happen overnight. Okay guys, so I got through the nine questions that were on my list. My voice didn't go, so we're good. Sorry that some of the answers were a bit short and maybe a little bit all over the place. You know, you can't think straight sometimes when you're not feeling 100%. Thanks a lot for your questions. If you've got questions for the next one, then post them in the comment section down below. We'll go through them on a weekly basis, two week, whatever, in this sort of informal way. That way I can get through a lot of them. And I hope you have a good weekend or if you're watching this during the week, have a great trading week. Leave a thumbs up if you like the video. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Take care guys, bye bye.